You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of uh, Collected Works number 266, volume one of three volumes in this number, entitled From the Esoteric School, Esoteric Lessons, 1904 to 1909 by Rudolf Steiner, translated by James H. Hines. This is part one, which are lectures entitled Elucidations of the Fundamental Preconditions for Independent Acquisition of Higher Knowledge. Lecture 1, given in Berlin on February 8, 1904. Many of those who have heard what I myself have said and who have read what is given in theosophical books as a means to seeing for oneself, for knowing what theosophy reports, will say that these means, control of thought, patience, and that which I have called the longing for freedom, do not look like they could really lead one to such knowledge. Most people form entirely wrong ideas about these things. They think that one must ascend to knowledge of higher worlds through special feats, through a very special spiritual training. Many will say, quote, How often have I tried to control my thoughts? How often have I tried to apply the means given? I have achieved nothing by doing so. Close quote. I can believe all that. In my descriptions, I have neither wanted to evoke the conviction that it is particularly difficult to tread the path on which we acquire higher knowledge, nor did I want to evoke the conviction that in the sense many intend, it is especially easy. For fundamentally speaking, neither is correct. Therefore, concerning these things, I would like to express myself now with more precision. Namely, I would like to speak to those who again and again object. Quote, How can I believe that through control of thought, patience, and so forth, I can become what one calls a seer in astral space, a seer in Devakan. Those who have this view strike me as those who claim quote, how locomotives move forward is incomprehensible to me because we see nothing more than a man throwing coal into the machine. Close quote. Now, it is clear that the man is doing something that has absolutely no similarity with the movement of the train. And nevertheless, through his heating, he creates the warmth that creates the steam that brings forth the movement. This picture shows clearly what is also the case in the spiritual realm. When we really strive to control our thoughts, then this activity of thought control is related to what is finally achieved in the same way that the activity of the Coleman in the locomotive is related to the trip from, say, St. Petersburg to Paris. This picture can be developed further. Imagine that the man continues to throw coal onto the boiler, into the boiler, on and on, but the heat just continues to flow out into the surroundings with nothing done to transform the warmth into an energy that moves the train forward. Think of how much power would be wasted there. As a matter of fact, people of our culture waste boundless amounts of energy in the same way as the warmth is lost, when their thought forces flow into the environment. Boundless amounts of energy that are developed in our life of thought and feelings. What is lost in this way daily and flows into meaninglessness could be used to acquire direct, supersensible knowledge. 
then we would experience a fast ascent in development, which is what the theosophical movement strives for. Allow me to describe in a few words the ways in which these forces are wasted. Our Western culture is set up to cause human beings to waste a vast quantity of forces simply through the fact that more than anywhere else, we in the West develop thoughts. But almost all these thoughts are uncontrolled, uncontrolled in the way they arise, uncontrolled in the way they are carried further, and uncontrolled in the way they are taken up again. And so they are lost without having led us to the goal of the knowledge we sought. The difficulty in achieving what is called control of thought, although it is very easy when it is earnestly striven for, lies in this, that we must strive against boundless preconceptions. I would like to illustrate this with an example. You will admit that endless amounts of thought are applied today to the problem of improving social conditions. There is no end to the thinking on this topic. But for those who really know what thought control is, because it lives in their flesh and blood, all this thought power is for the most part wasted. Those who do not think their thoughts to an end, who do not strive to make clear to themselves the activity of thought control, who do not consider that in the moment something is thought in the world, another thought which completes or controls the first, must also be thought. Those people cannot control their thoughts. For of what value is it if a benefactor does good deeds with a financial contribution and does not think about where his money is flowing? That is not intended as a criticism, because it is connected with our present conditions. It is made unbelievably difficult for human beings to control their thoughts because, so to speak, we cannot do otherwise than to live with millions and millions of prejudices and preconceived notions. Isn't almost every thought that we have simply a prejudgment or prejudice? If we do not attempt to place these prejudices clearly before the soul, in order a to at least inwardly get free from the world of prejudices that flow into us daily, then thought control is not possible. It is not possible to arrive at genuine clairvoyance. Those who really practice thought control and acquire the gift of spiritual sight, they know that through thought control it is possible to acquire what we call astral and devaconic sight, that is simply experience. However, our entire modern life is designed to divert thinking. It is as though it wants to distract our thought forces from outside with magnetic forces. It is the destroyer of the genuine power of clairvoyance. I would like to present a significant example. A little while ago I spoke with a writer who is highly esteemed here in Berlin. I spoke of how much energy that could have been used to benefit humanity was lost through vanity. The significance of what I meant to convey, he understood so little that he responded by saying that we are actually all vain and that vanity is the motivating force behind success. These people know that they are excessively vain. They know that what makes our present-day art great and significant can also be achieved under the influence of stormy vanity. However, enormous vanity will never deepen a human being. Overcoming vanity is just as easy for those who strive for it as achieving thought control is easy for those not wanting to remain stuck in the prejudices of the world. Curiosity works to destroy the gift of clairvoyance just as much 
as vanity. Already in the early morning hours, people filled with curiosity read their newspapers. The curiosity-driven desire to know what has happened must be overcome. People cannot believe that curiosity is so detrimental for the gift of clairvoyance. Neither can they distinguish two different ways of taking in information. Some people take it in, not because they are curious, but in order to use it as a tool. They do not acquire the information for their own sakes, but in order to intervene to help other people when the opportunity presents itself. To give an example for clarification, consider the first sentences of the book titled Light on the Path by Mabel Collins. They are intended to serve as training toward clairvoyance and are unbelievably easy to follow. Number one, kill off ambition. Number two, kill off love of life. Number three, kill off the wish for comfort. These three are deeply rooted in our lives, but they also make it impossible for the gift of clairvoyance to arise. And then number four, Work as though work who are ambitious. Value life as those who love it. Be happy as those who live only for happiness. Seers do not become useless for life. They do not waste energy. They place even the least thing they do in the service of their higher work. That becomes a matter of course for them. These four sentences in Title Light on the Path are preceded by a series of conditions. Before the eyes can see, they must be incapable of tears. Before the ear can hear, it must have lost its sensitiveness. Before the voice can speak in the presence of the Masters, it must have lost the power to wound. Before the soul can stand in the presence of the Masters, Its feet must be washed in the blood of the heart. We must make our deeds, our actions, fruitful, so that they help everyone, so that they enkindle striving because they are deeds of living forces. All of that is nearly impossible in our culture, where everyone believes he or she is entitled to have an opinion believes him or herself justified in finding one thing good and great and another thing bad. Thus our culture does not even bring us to the first step on the path to higher knowledge, to the stage called raven. In the language of the initiate, raven signifies someone who selflessly strives not to judge. It is not meant that such people become indifferent but that they simply hold back from passing judgments. The word raven characterizes people who do not say that the most important thing is what they think about other people and situations, but rather who say to themselves, I must find out what others think about them. I must immerse myself in the souls of others and find out what lives in them. Close quote. If one is in a position to do that, then one has arrived at the first stage. Again, this is very easy for those who do not live with prejudices, but very difficult for those who live in the modern culture and must refrain from criticizing. The raven is the first stage of the Persian Mithras initiation. This is the first stage that must sink into every soul. The higher initiates have all passed through this stage. They had to understand why a person does this or does that. Look around in your own world. One person does this, another that. People are so inclined to say, He did that, he should not have done that. What is of essence here is not to judge why a person did this or that. In some Those who seek to develop an inner life must have passed through the life of the raven. Without prejudice, they must have sought out in every soul the motives for actions. About 
Such a person, it is said, quote, he or she sends out ravens, close quote. Something of this is echoing in the Kufhäuser saga when it says, quote, Kaiser Rothbart sends out the ravens, close quote. This does not refer to his seeking information about the surrounding world, but to his inquiring concerning the souls of the people and whether he himself can now intervene in them. One must learn to understand, and in the highest sense, that is what tolerance is. Those who proceed from their own point of view boldly and sharply will arrive at the gift of clairvoyance as little as those who strive for success with impatient expectation. Think of all the striving out of vanity, of all the curiosity, all that flows away like the heat of a steam kettle into space. Countless energy is lost in this way. You must regard this as a fundamental law. The moment you strive to satisfy your curiosity, you are throwing away your spiritual forces. If you were to keep them to yourself, then you would be able to transform them into higher knowledge. If you can manage just one time to not see something that you would really like to see, then you are saving energy, energy that remains with you, that is not lost. The same is true when you tame your impulse to impart information to others. Ordinarily, it works this way. Whenever anything is said anywhere, then it must be told further so that the surrounding world also benefits from it. However, things should not be shared with others for the sake of talking, but rather every word should be used to express only what should be said. When that becomes a basic law, then the gift of higher seeing gradually will be developed. This is the experience of those who see. Those who must always speak, even when their words are entirely without significance, will not come far. We can save up forces within us only by overcoming the drive to impart information that is without essence or significance. These are the paths that in and of themselves are easy to tread if one wants to tread them. However, very few people follow these paths because they are considered insignificant. Progress does not depend on any special training, but on continual work on our inner life in everyday life. In this way one ascends in the schools for initiates to the second degree, to the stage of the veiled, quote, the occult ones, close parenthesis. Those who test every single word, if it should be spoken this way or that, who have lost the ability to wound through constantly testing their words, who have placed a veil around themselves and, as it were, speak through the veil, those are the veiled. They are so advanced that they themselves become the creators of their own personalities, who test and control themselves with every movement of the hand, with every word. Without anyone noticing any such development, such a person can progress through the first and second stages. But he or she is not allowed to believe, quote, Now I am at the stage where I can penetrate into the souls of other people. Uh, now I can also say something. Close quote. For those who wish to say something, who want to be a teacher, who want to have authoritative significance, must wait until they achieve the third degree of initiation, the stage of the warrior. What is written in title Light on the Path in the second chapter concerning the warriors applies to them. The first chapter is written for everyone. The second chapter is written for those who want to teach their fellow human beings. But in a certain sense, it is written for everyone, for every human being should teach his or her fellow human beings. But only those who observe these rules can hope that their words find response. 
No theosophical teacher should ever speak a word without observing the fundamental principles. Number one, step to the side in the coming battles. And even if you do battle, do not be the warrior. Number two, be on the lookout for the warrior. Let him do the fighting within you. Number three, await his instruction to battle. Follow it. No one can become a warrior who fights for himself, who does not step aside. The greatest enemies of a higher inner development are, therefore, curiosity, vanity, empty chattiness, where words are spoken in order to be speaking, instead of waiting to see if words are necessary and if others want to listen, and, finally, falling to temptation. Even true theosophists and mystics cannot avoid the approach of temptation. They allow it to approach them, just as anyone else would, in order to follow the voice within themselves, despite the temptation. As soon as they become teachers, they must step aside. If they were to fall into even the smallest temptation, then their powers would disappear, would flow out of them like warmth from a boiling kettle. However, if they manage to resist even the smallest, most insignificant temptation, then they retain the power within themselves and it will bear fruit. Thus, from what otherwise would be lost, if we save it up through the indicated exercises, if we accumulate it, then we will gradually acquire, entirely unnoticed, the gift of inner sight. And that is the end of Lecture 1.